Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming today. My name is Lindsay and I'm here to talk about MAP 2020 and addressing humanitarian challenges with street level imagery. So first I'd like to introduce Mapillary. Mapillary is a collaborative platform for map data. So that means anyone with any camera anywhere in the world can contribute to the platform. That's map data where it's needed most, when it's needed most. There's currently over 700 million images on the Mapillary platform across over 190 countries. But if you zoom into this area around the equator between 20 north and 20 south, you can see that there's a lot of gaps in the coverage. And this is also an area where a lack of updated maps is making it difficult to address many humanitarian challenges. So that's where MAP 2020 comes in. MAP 2020 is a campaign that was uh, put together by us at Mapillary and HOT to map the undermapped regions of the world. There were 33 different teams from 27 countries, and that includes Colombia, Nigeria, Bangladesh, and today we're going to be hearing about three projects from Iraq, Ukraine, and Uganda. The teams were addressing issues, everything from waste management and natural disaster response to damage public roads and urban mobility. But altogether, street level imagery, there were 373,000 images collected. But part of MAP 2020 is really to help us understand at Mapillary how we can be more useful in helping to address humanitarian challenges. So now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Eduardo, who's going to talk about some of the highlights and challenges of this campaign. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay, so the list of challenges might look bigger than the highlights. There were a lot of challenges, but I think it was definitely a positive campaign overall. So let's start with the, the challenges. So number one, in some areas, it's hard to find internet connection. So if you came to our talk yesterday, you would have heard all the challenges with low speed upload, uh, low upload speeds, and how that influences the, the time it takes to upload imagery. So that was something a lot of the people participating in the challenge had to face. Number two, the majority of the projects only uploaded a small number of images. So we actually had, I think, what was it, 35 projects presenting, something like that, or actually signing up for the challenge. Only a small fraction of those uploaded a substantial number of images. And I think that's in, due in large part to issue number one. The quality of images varied a lot as well between projects. So some kind of hadn't really had the training necessary. So they were taking photos of the ground or blurry photos. A lot of the photos were obstructed. So that's another thing like our training material probably needs to be better to make sure that they know how to take good imagery. Four, uh, equipping cameras can get some negative attention from government agencies and locals. There's a lot of issues in some countries walking with your phone in front of you on the street, people covering their faces. So Sometimes you kind of need to adapt to the situation, maybe drive a car and have a dash cam, which is a bit less obvious, or ride a bicycle where, where people uh, might not notice it as much. And then the last one there, so part of this challenge was getting people to edit in OpenStreetMap, and so they were adding tags to OpenStreetMap to look at things like waste, uh, where waste disposal sites are, and some of the tagging associated with these different projects wasn't exactly in line with the OpenStreetMap wiki or with the country standardization. So that's another thing, just making sure that when we encourage people to map, that they're using tags that are consistent with, the, with what OpenStreetMap has discussed and kind of agreed upon. But on the more positive side, so the teams in Erbil and Dhaka really demonstrated what we we're trying to promote now, which is dense capture. So that's where you get every street in a locality and you say, okay, I'm going to map this small area, but I'm going to do it to 100%. I won't miss a road. And then you can make sure that you've actually derived as, map, as much map data in that area as possible. So this was one of the first time we'd seen, we'd actually seen this in a humanitarian context. The second thing is capture projects. So this really ties into number one. This is a tool that we have at Mapillary that allows you, if you have a, an organization, to assign different zones to people. And again, this was the first time we'd seen it used in a humanitarian context. So that's pretty exciting to see them using tools that were developed for business customers but applying it in Dhaka and, and other places around the world. We also discovered new waste management use cases, which you're going to hear about from Alex and Henry here. So that wasn't something we'd really focused on before, and these guys kind of showed us how Mapillary could be used in that context. 
Uh, second last point, a lot of new people getting involved. So some people hadn't actually used Mapillary that much, but this was an impetus for them to do that. And again, kind of new applications in Mapillary, so not just waste management, but there were many others out there as well. So the first project I'd like to talk about was in Erbil, Iraq. Now, Mohammed was one of the winners of MAP 2020. We had two winners. Unfortunately, his visa was going to take two months. So you can blame the German government or the French government because um, uh, he tried it both, but it was going to take two months. So we decided that maybe he could come next year, um, but he's going to be watching this. Hi, Mohammed. Um, and we'll talk about his use case and kind of the, um, what he was able to achieve in Herbal Iraq. A bit of context on Herbal. It's the capital of Iraqi Kurdistan, right up in the northern, northeastern part of Iraq. It's quite a large city, and unfortunately, they get hit, hit by a lot of earthquakes. The last major one was in 2017 on the Iraqi-Iranian border, and so this is something that's continually on their mind. How can we improve our preparedness against earthquakes? So this is Mohammed there, and his children, and some of the other people participating in the project. He actually had a lot of family members getting involved in capturing imagery. And uh, I think this is Hamza there. Is that Hamza, Lindsay? Yep, so Hamza was also considering coming to, um, coming to Germany if he could get a visa. But he's got a, a big background working with humanitarian agencies. So as he started to learn about OpenStreetMap, he kind of realized how it could, could tie into a lot of the other humanitarian work that he was doing previously. So just a quote from him, this specific map will be an important tool when a disaster strikes to assess the situation more quickly. The aim is to provide relief workers with the tools to facilitate the, de the decision making process. So when you actually look at the edits that he made uh, in OpenStreetMap, he was adding a lot of POIs, so using imagery to get addresses, uh, kind of how many stories a shop is, um, yeah, the name of the shop. So. This was added mostly as just single nodes to OpenStreetMap. And then you can also see in terms of his capture efforts and the other people uh, capturing imagery, they were capturing a lot of the main roads, the ar arterial roads that kind of feed traffic throughout the city, but also dense capture. And that was what I mentioned earlier with capture projects, which we talked about yesterday, where you can divide up, you can kind of draw a grid around this area and say, we're going to assign one person to the northwest, one person to the northeast. And you can't really see it too well there, but that is very densely captured, that neighborhood. So they can be confident that they've pretty much identified every traffic sign in the area using Mapillary's detections. Uh, so that kind of resulted in 400 chain sets, which is pretty exciting. A lot of new data in Herbal that wasn't actually there. There hadn't been much mapping. So in a very short time, he was able to add a lot. And using the imagery, you can see on the left, he's got OpenStreetMap ID editor up with Mapillary's um, imagery. And he's also got, he's looking on mapillary.com to see what detections we have, what kind of traffic signs we've detected, and other objects like trash cans, uh, crosswalks. And that's all extracted automatically. So you can have a look on OSM Char, a great tool. And if you type in Map 2020 in the search field, you can actually see all the change sets associated with Map 2020. So some in Uganda, some in Ukraine, and kind of go through and see how they were using Mapillary. So now I'd like to introduce Henry, who's flown all the way from Kampala. He's going to be talking about waste management, as is Alex, but uh, really good use case in Kampala, how to use Mapillary to identify waste sites and then present that information to the government. <clears throat> Thank you, Edodo. Um, Henry said, like I said, um, it's Mapa based in Macquarie University. Yeah, so during the month of June, like as like she introduced, um, we took part in a mapping campaign, dubbed Map 2020. So, um, so we focused on illegal waste dumping sites. So um, <clears throat> according to statistics, there's a report in 2017 that showed um, how much disposable waste is actually collected around the globe. So um, Europe, 96% of the waste is collected. Um, first, moving forward, Sub-Saharan Africa, where Uganda is located, only 40% is collected. So 60% is left, you know, um, disposed of, I mean, to people. I mean, exposed. So, um, <clears throat> so almost 827,000 people in low- and middle-income countries die as a result of inadequate water, sanitation, and all these related problems. So, and it's estimated that 
almost 432,000 deaths uh, actually um, attributed to poor sanitation. So um, this is a slum in Kampala. So you can see that not only um, are these slums congested, there's poor, poor um, you know, drainage, then also poor, of course, dispose of um, waste. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> the United Nations stated one of its goals as um, wanting to achieve sustainable cities and communities. And one of, having a, one of the ways of having a sustainable cities and communities is having clean cities. So um, that's where we, you know, based our project from. So um, we focused on the first indicator, 11.6.1, which focuses on knowing how much of the disposed waste is actually collected and fully taken out. Yeah. So um, to give this context, Kampala is located in Uganda, like he said. So in the morning, I think uh, Mwanja tried to show us how where Tanzania is located compared to Germany. So Uganda neighbors, you know, Tanzania. So we are there. So it's the largest city and the only city in Uganda, located in central Uganda, and has an estimated population of 1.6 million people. So um, a total area of 189, and then also a population density of almost 8,000 people. So it's crowded. Yeah. So um, like those pictures show these uh, workers of local authorities trying so much to dispose of this waste. Then that's a street in Kampala. You can see people first pile the rubbish in um, sacks and taken away. So um, according to the local authority, it's estimated that almost 375, I mean, 750 tons of waste are, uh, you know, generated every day. But um, only um, the local authority mandated to, you know, collect off and dispose of this waste is called Kampala Capital City Authority. So it leases out part of its mandate to other local, I mean, private companies that do this collection. So um, all these companies joint only have a, um, a capacity of collecting of 175 tons. So that's almost a deficit of 400 tons every day. So that's a very big problem. So that's an example of a pile of rubbish just close to people's homes. That, those are people's homes. Then in the third frame, um, that's, those are people, again, close to and exposed to this rubbish. Yeah. So um, part of the first phase of the campaign was to actually collect this imagery like Lindsay um, explained. So I and my team of five people, we undertook um, the data collection using smartphones. So in the first room, that's me. Um, then those are my team members. So we did this for almost two to three weeks, um, data capture. So the second phase, um, um, it involved create adding this adding data to OpenStreetMap using the images that we had um, collected. So we had to first um, create a shape. Of course, after the capture project, process that Edward explained yesterday. So um, after capturing project, um, creating a shape, everything, so we, that's us um, adding that data to OpenStreetMap. So we had to choose a tag that best um, described what we were doing. So we realized that the tag that could come close to describing what we were adding was land use, and then you tag it as a landfill, Plus, I mean, informal plus yes, to show that it's an informal or illegal dumping site. Then, of course, rubbish or trash cans were um, tagged as waste collection baskets. So those were the two major, um, the two major, major tags we used. So um, we created a shape. So that's, that that was our shape. It encompasses four villages in Kampala, Makere, Chikoni. So um, that was our shape, so you can see some of the statistics. There were 115 almost images added, uploaded. And um, 
36.8 kilometers covered. Yeah. So um, after subscribing for the map data that um, had been, you know, identified, we um, turned on our map data to look for trash cans in particular, since they defined our project more. So um, very many trash cans were, were identified by MAPE's computer vision algorithms, but um, most of them were actually not, not trash cans. They were just semi-temporary buildings. Yeah, so maybe my, um, they, they were mis misrepresented, but there was one trash can. So we had to go through all this, um, identified, identified um, map data, see if it fitted the area. Yeah. Now, since there's no, I mean, I think my pair, the computer vision cannot identify the, these dumping sites. So we had to manually go through the, the sequences. So we had to um, go to OpenStreetMap, turn on the map area overlay layer, then go through the sequences one by one. Yeah, so where we saw, um, for example, a, a rubbish pile, we then added um, a polygon at that point and then tagged it as the tags had said land use, land fill, plus informal. Yes. So that's an example of a bit, a pipe. Yeah, so we saved our change sets as MOP2020 added unofficial waste dumping sites. So we pass monitor the data we had added so that we could um, see it later. So overall, we added in this period 115, almost 115,000 images. We were able to identify 50 dumping sites. And like I said, one trash can, because there are not very many um, trash cans along Kampa roads. So that GIF shows the data that we added to the project. So lessons learned throughout this project. So we learned that um, rubbish ships, like those, um, the rubbish ships are not identifiable. Um, they cannot, you know, be identified or mapped by Mapere's computer vision. And yet they are very, very prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa. So we also saw that actually um, seed level imagery is um, a very good way of mapping dumping sites. Because when you use satellite images that are used on, uh, maybe that we normally use to map, you cannot really see these dumping sites. Whereas street level images give you a clear view and of where it is allocated. So data retrieving wasn't a straightforward process. So that was also a lesson. Then also we saw that um, to undertake and you know complete such projects, you need collaborative approaches. You need to you know. Um, teach local communities how to use this platform so that they help you to map and so you cover a bigger area and a small, I mean, in a, in a small time. Additionally, you, you know, build capacity, very many people learn about these platforms. So going forward, um, we were able to map four villages in two to three weeks and there are almost, it's estimated there are almost 57 slums in Kampala alone. And this is a problem in the whole Uganda. So we plan to um, continue with the data capturing. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. So we're going to we're going to continue with the waste management theme, and I'll pass it over to Alex and his wife Sophia. They've driven 36 hours with these three great kids who are very well behaved in the audience. So I'm gonna hand it over to Alex and Sophia and they'll talk about uh, what they achieved in Kiev, Kiev, <laughs> Kiev, Kiev, okay. Uh, hi to everyone. Uh, today uh, we would like our uh -huh. uh, 
Today we would like to you to tell you about our pilot project Mapillary Waste Control uh, that was held in uh, Kyiv, uh, the capital of Ukraine. Uh, what is the connection between a humanitarian mission Hot Awesome Map 2020, goals we stated and what we uh, Kyiv is a rather big city. Its square is uh, 8,048 square kilometers and more than 3 million people uh, live there. So uh, 1.2 million tons of household waste in a year. Some official uh, data we got. Uh, we found out uh, that about 11 uh, 1,900 bins are placed in Kyiv, uh, 11,000 cubic meters are picked up monthly by 120 units of special lorries, so 8,500 houses are served, and uh, more than 60% of which is uh, picked up to, to landfills, about 25% uh, is picked up to our uh, incinerator um, Energy and about 10% uh, is recycled. Uh -huh. uh, Kyiv uh, has uh, 10 administrative uh, districts, uh, seven of which are situated on the right bank on, uh, of the river Dnieper. Dnipro and three on the left bank. So our project, for our project, we took the right bank territory, seven districts uh, inhabited by two million people. Collecting uh, the data and identification of waste disposal uh, based on the platform for street uh, level ima imagery uh, and map data mapillary. Uh, we opened uh, the OSM and found out that there was much work to do. So we created the project Waste Control, uh, and the main goal of which was to pay attention uh, on the waste control in large city to make the situation more clearly concerning the availability of waste uh, disposals in parks, squares, and also in residential areas, uh, so to make our city more clear. Uh, first, we set uh, the goal to data collection about all the waste disposals, I mean rubbish bins, trash cans, underground storage, etc., on pointed territory. Later, we reduced this control to big waste disposal only, and it was connected with the data pointing and in future the possible loading on OSM map. Anyway, all the collected data will be in safe. We can point all uh, of them on separate uh, map later, uh, where trash cans and underground storage would be pointed at separate uh, units. Uh, to tell the truth, one month is not enough for such a huge project, um, especially if uh, to notice uh, that this project was held in the same time as complete the map and also many Participants uh, had their summer holidays in this period, so only six participants took part in waste control. They collected uh, the data on smartphones, action cameras. Uh, as the waste disposals are situated in the middle part of most residential areas, the participants uh, were trying to get data passing through every area, not to miss the place uh, for waste disposals. They did it on bikes or by foot, and we got good results. Here are all of uh, the images we collected. Uh, on Mapillary, you have the possibility to filter by the map feature presented uh, in your images. Here you see trash cans that we located uh, in our images. Uh, the orange dots are all of the images uh, where trash cans were detected that allowed mapillary to determine uh, the location of uh, the trash bins. Uh, how does it look in uh, reality and what is the data consistency and of course uh, the observation of hygiene regulation were the goals of our project waste control. 
The most difficult scene is when the locate, uh, uh, loaded photo sequences has fall, uh, false location. We solved this problem manually with the help uh, of uh, a correction possibility on uh, Mapillary website. We began uh, the project concerning the verification of garbage bins on photos with the help of uh, Mapillary Marketplace. The project Dustman has turned out quite popular and involved 118 participants all over the world. Uh, the detected uh, data uh, was applied manually on OSM map uh, with the editor ID, uh, was quickly and uh, conveniently. We used ordinary combination, control C, control V in text, field ID, sometimes made changes in some meanings in specific cases, such text as amenity, waste disposal, waste, access, operator, capacity, material. Six participants got about uh, 1,550 uh, 50 images, uh, took a new look at many places on images uh, where disposal bins could be add new unique images on mapillary pointed on OSM, uh, the bigger part of bins, and recognized ten of thousands of objects. Uh, for today, we pointed out uh, about uh, 500 ways disposals. Uh, we used the information from the images made for the project waste control. So we got the information about the type of garbage, capacity and materials of bin, access to the bins and serving a company in such a way. The project Waste Control Dustman uh, was planned as a test project for better understanding the involvement and interest of others. From uh, the very beginning we set a high goal to realize uh, that uh, one month to proce process all the data will not be enough. Kyiv is a very big city with a complex waste disposal system. Our next step, step uh, will be to continue working on the project and uh, it is possible that it may even become an independent one. But the most interesting in this project is the uh, knowledge they got. It was very important to have enough memory on devices or to get uh, broadband internet access for rapid loading. Power bank was not a, uh, an extra thing also. Uh, we used different variants of data loadings with, uh, via smartphone application, website, mapillary, based on uh, Python uh, mapillary tools. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, it's not still time for ta uh, talking about the final results and make conclusions, but the goal is clear and we are going to realize it. We are planning to attract more interested participants, uh, waste management companies and uh, districts uh, municipalities uh, hope that uh, this will help companies to handle uh, waste uh, more efficiently and uh, municipalities uh, will be able to carry out uh, uh, the explanatory work on recycling and separate garbage collection among our population, reduce uh, the unhygienic condition created by garbage cans, thereby improving the quality of life of people. Thank you very much, Sophia, for coming here and uh, explaining that to us. So we're just going to wrap it up, and then I think we have a, a good amount of time for questions. So I think one thing that comes up a lot, mentioned it yesterday at the start as well, I think Lindsay mentioned it, but we're trying to understand how mapillary can be applied in humanitarian scenarios. And like a lot of technology, I think sometimes there's the the risk of thinking that it solves all problems. A lot of technology companies like to say that they, they do. Um, so I think we're very conscious about not saying that. Mapillary is not a panacea to, direct, to collect all map data in a certain area, but it's one part of a process. And so I think over the last two days, you would have heard a lot of different tools that can be used. Not all those tools should be used every time. There's a, a place for them, and often they're just one part of the process. You can have the best tools, but it doesn't mean it's going to solve the job. So we're trying to understand better how Mapillary can solve different problems, what problems we can solve, what problems we can't. And a big part of that is thanks to Alex and Henry. 
and uh, yeah, we're not we're not the Jesus of mapping or by any means. Um, I think there's a lot of that in Silicon Valley at the moment, so we're just very conscious of that. And the other aspect to this was that the outcomes are always better when there's dense image capture. So if you look at Kiev, so many of the roads are covered now because people have really made sure to go and get even the small roads that often get mapped uh, or get missed by the bigger mapping companies. And because you have dense capture, you can really make sure that the map is complete for everyone. That could be routing, but it could also be waste disposal sites. But that next step really is making sure this data is available to government and then someone actually does something. Because unless the government is taking decisions based upon this information, nothing's really changed and all of this is to waste. So this is really only step one or two and there's a lot of steps ahead as Sophia was saying at the end. So a lot to be learned from the works of Henry, Muhammad, Alex and others. But um, yeah, we're looking forward to probably doing this again early next year and building upon it, but also seeing kind of what data we can derive and how we can present it to government in a way where they actually take action. So I think we'll open it up now for questions in the last 10 minutes and questions to Alex and Henry as well. They've got all the answers. Thanks for the presentations. So this workflow, is it just applicable for the dumping sites or could it be extended to other feature extractions as well? Maybe like just for me to know about the infrastructure in my city. Yeah, it actually is useful for a lot of, for a lot of different use cases. So Mapillary actually identifies quite a few features from images. So things like crosswalks, which we used in Bangladesh, things like benches. So these are features that we automatically extract from an image and then make available. Mm -hmm. So in the case of these MAP2020 projects, we asked them what features they were interested in and then allowed them to download those. And but it could be, you know, going forward, we've had a lot of customers in the humanitarian space asking us whether we can identify things like windows of various types, uh, potential faults in a building so they can know if it's vulnerable to earthquakes. So the, the list of features grows, but there are many different use cases that we try to address. I think the other ones in MAP2020 were flooding, uh, there was some on just urban mobility as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not specifically waste disposal. Okay. Now the question on the Kampala case study. Uh, so there was a point about... Uh, so you mentioned about difficulty in data extraction. Uh, difficulty in extracting the data that you added on OpenStreetMap. What was the problem? Like, was it a tagging error? <coughs> um, it wasn't the tagging, but... Um, I guess we were just, you know, limited in skills. Okay. Yeah, but after um, consulting, yeah, we um, did it with Chris, and yeah, we were actually able to retrieve the data. We were going to come up with a final map that is presentable to the authorities. Okay. Yeah, so I think it was just limitation in knowledge. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's a question for Henry. Uh, with the informal dumping sites, it seems like it's possible new sites will appear in the future. So do you see this as a need to continually take new photos to find changing sites? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's a very good question. Um, like we had said that going forward, we have to map again, these areas, because these are dynamic, it's a dynamic thing. I mean, people continuously dump this, um, this rubbish there. So I think it will be very good if we remap that area, but since we are limited in capacity, we would want to also cover other areas, but I think it will be very important to also remap after a specific time. You go back on those streets and see. And uh, with Kiev, a similar question. Uh, it seems the waste disposal sites in Kiev are very permanent. They're not moving. But do you think there will be changes that you have to map? Uh, 
Uh, we hope uh, that uh, new uh, participants uh, uh, will be also uh, accompanied to our project uh, and uh, so to develop uh, our uh, project uh, more images and separate uh, map uh, with um, separating trash cans and uh, rubbish uh, bins uh, underground uh, uh -huh. and underground storage thank you Yeah, my question is for uh, Muhammad from Iraq, who is not here, so maybe Ed will answer. Uh, so one question is, like, what, what is the humanitarian uh, challenge they were trying to solve for Iraq? And then uh, for such, because you mentioned that uh, there were some new people who were finding about MAPRE for the very first time through this project. So what's the plan for MAPRE to continue supporting these uh, new community members? Yeah, so for the use case that Iraq was trying to address, that was earthquake resilience. I think he was kind of just discovering as he went what features would be relevant in OpenStreetMap to help uh, earthquake resilience. And so he focused mostly on points of interest, so knowing like what a building actually is. And my guess from what he described was that if an earthquake does strike and you have a good map of an area, you know, where the commercial districts are, where the residential districts are, like roughly how many people would be in that location and you know so if humanitarian agencies responding they know where most people are likely to be at a given time and the casualty rate so that was what he was focused on i think it's going to be a long journey though to actually comprehensively map herbal iraq and then in terms of how we support them going forward i think we try to always i guess over the last year focus on the ones that are more active. Um, there's a lot of people who kind of get involved, but Maplery might be just one part of their tool set and they don't really have time to focus on it. So we do talk to them, we try and help them if we can. But then if, if there are projects like Henry's and Alex's that are particularly active, we try to support with camera grants, for example, so the Maplery camera grant program, which is available for those who have more than 50,000 images and they can apply, tell us what they're actually trying to solve. And we, if we think it's a good candidate and a good location, we'll send them a camera. So that's one thing. We do a lot of training workshops. We walk through capture projects, which is the tool that they used in Dhaka. And I think going forward, um, hopefully next year, we'll send two new people at least to state of the map and they'll be able to um, kind of show what they've achieved. So Mohammed will probably come and then we'll have another project. So this is likely to continue. We not, might not be able to call it Map 2020 anymore, but um, we'll find a new name for next year and run it again. All right, thanks everyone. We're going to be around until the end of State of the Map, so if you want to have a discussion, we'd love to chat. Thanks.